Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, brothers, inshallah, we could uh, move a bit forward, inshallah. I feel comfortable. This is going to take time. And this is going to be a monthly journey, so please relax. It's a Friday night, uh, but I think it's the best time for us to have this discussion. And inshallah, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his guidance. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his assistance. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his mercy. Ameen ya rabbil alameen. Without further ado, alhamdulillah wa kafa wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa mawala Amma ba'ad rabbi yassir wa la tu'assir wa tammin bil khayri wa bika nasta'inu ya fatah Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa ahlul uqtata min lisaan yafqahu qawli Rabbi zidni ilma wa lhiqni bil salihin Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma'allamtana innaka antil alimul hakim Subhanaka la fahma lana illa ma fahamtana innaka antil jawadul kareem Brothers and sisters in Islam, I welcome you to the beginning of a very long journey wherein we are going to insha'Allah take the pieces of the puzzle which is known as knowledge. And we are going to accumulate all these pieces of knowledge from history, from biblical text and also from the Quran and Hadith and inshallah with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala formulate some type of a picture that will give us an understanding of the world that we live in today. Why are we doing this and what is it that we want to accomplish from this is the topic with which we will begin today inshallah. Uh, without further ado, why are we doing this? I think it's imperative that we set the tone and unite on a similar foundation because it's easy for someone to come into a community and speak on a topic and leave but if the community members are not on the same foundation or platform it becomes very difficult not only to comprehend it but to utilize that knowledge brothers and sisters we are Muslims yes or no and we claim that our faith is both universal and eternal yes or no i.e. we believe that this Islam is for all people with no exception. Islam didn't come for the Arabs and exclude the non-Arabs. Islam didn't come for the white and excluded the black. Rasulullah spoke about this. There is no superiority of an Arab over a non-Arab, uh, a white over a black. Illa bi Allah. He made very clear in his life and his message as to that this religion is for every person. Regardless of how society sees them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees everyone as his creation. Yes or no? So we believe that this deen, this Quran, this Islam is for all people. And it is for all times to the day of judgment. I.e. we believe, and again there's a difference between our belief and the reality of our belief. You know, you could have a car, but you may not drive that car, so that car really isn't a car. It is just a model for you. You may have shoes, and those shoes are so nice, you don't want to wear them because they're expensive. So those shoes are really not shoes, they're just uh, a, a staple of your fashion. You know, this is what I have, this is what I like, but if you don't use it, it is really of no use. We say Islam is for all times till the day of judgment, hence that means that Islam's relevancy today, in the middle of October, in Texas, America, is as relevant as it was 1450 years ago when Rasulullah began the risala and the message. Yes or no? We believe that. But there is a belief and then there is the articulation of that belief. The problem is, the reality is today that we do not find relevancy of the text in our time. And everyone here can agree to some, to some fashion that nowadays our Islam, our discussions, our topics, our khutbahs have become more and more irrelevant with our world. 
We need to understand blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies. We need to understand is life insurance in the same level as Beitul Mal at that time. But no one talks about that. We have a system globally where everyone is talking about pastime. Correct me if I'm wrong, please. When I'm saying we, majority, al aktharu fi hukm al kul, there is a rule in Arabic that majority speaks for everyone. And then when we quote Islamic understanding, explanations, fatawa, tafasir, we quote ancient people, yes or no? Hundred, two hundred, maybe less, maybe more. Years. And no one dare touch the topic. If you try to bring relevancy of the text to the world today, you will be considered an outcast. You will be considered someone who is openly doing something wrong with Islam. And that is what Allah subhanahu wa said in the Holy Quran. In numerous places, Inna wajadna abaana ala ummatin wa inna ala atarihi muqtadun. Inna wajadna abaana kadalika yafalun. There was a mindset. Remember, there's so many verses in the Quran that you and I can, in logic, in logic, agree it has no relevancy with what we're doing. Because the story of Dhul Qarni has no relevancy with me and my Islam. What people used to say to the prophets at that time has no relevancy with our time, or does it? They used to say to their prophets, the two verses I just quoted, we found our forefathers doing this, and that is what we will follow. Or we found our forefathers doing exactly what we are doing. The Qur'an stated these verses to tell you and I, let us never fall into that pit where we say our religion is secure because our forefathers did it. That our religion is pure because 200 years ago or 100 years ago, a great scholar or saint gave a fatwa or wrote a book. When we are dragging the past to the present, the question becomes, what is our future going to hold on to? We do not see the rise of scholarship at that level today that our children can say tomorrow, this is what we grew up learning from these people. But they will say, we grew up learning from these people what they spoke about those people. Inna wajadna abaana. We found our forefathers doing something. We're sticking to that. And you dare walk out of sight that ream, you're considered an outcast. So the problem with our faith is that we do not find relevancy of the text in our time. We don't find connection with most of what is going on in our world. The Quran talks about donkeys. The Quran talks about camels. Here we're talking about the hyperloop, which is already ready to start its services in many countries. We're talking about forms of technology that will take you to other planets and we're talking about donkeys and camels. If Allah does not give us the nur of the Qur'an, there will be no nur to guide your path. Remember your Qur'an spoke about planes. It spoke about supersonic jets. Yes. It spoke about the automobiles that are on the road today and those that are coming tomorrow. Allah created the horse, uh, the mule, the donkey, so that you may ride on these things and also use it as a staple of your status. Ferrari, Bentley, Aston Martin, Ford Focus, right? Don't come out of Ford Focus yet. Ford Focus is fine. It's a status of who you are, and it serves the purpose of driving. Allah says, I am creating that which you don't know. So what came in Elon Musk's mind for the electric vehicle, Allah said, I'm creating what you don't know. I will use whoever I have to use to do what I want to do, but I'm doing it, remember that. 
if Allah doesn't show us that light, then Allah is not holding back that light. We are not understanding the importance of the existence of that light. So not only do we find the lack of relevancy of text, we find the connection is lost. And thirdly, we can't even relate to our faith in the current world. So where did it all go wrong? Where did this go wrong? In the past, Muslim scholars navigated the Ummah and the world through the Qur'an and Hadith. Now you may sit here today and say, this sounds extreme, all Qur'an and Sunnah, how did the world function? The world did function. Science did thrive. Medical, tech, me medical science, it grew. People learned things that, at that time which would baffle you when you realize what they did. They knew what to look out for and what to be a part of. They had an understanding of the real world. The world that the Creator and Master Allah Himself calls Mata'ul Ghurur. The Allah who calls this world a deception and the tools of deception, the scholars walk this earth knowing those tools and knowing those deceptions. And they guided the Ummah through that time. It's like any video game you play. And there are places where you can get things that will help you and there's places that you can feel things that will hurt you. You just have to know that. And many a times people have to try and fail to realize that this plant will make me lose my life and this mushroom will make me grow. What game am I talking about? Mario brother, come on, Mario is still strong. Mario is still strong. But sadly, something happened. Not to Islam. Islam is still perfect, yes or no? The Qur'an is still protected. There's a reason why Allah said He will protect the Qur'an. But what happened to Islamic scholarship? I want to take you back to one of the incidents that I can go back to. That changed the course of Islamic knowledge and the production of scholars. In 1857, something happened in India, the region of Hind. What happened was, the British Empire in 1857 colonized Hind. Colonized what everyone? I want to hear from you. Hind. Don't say India. Hind. And Hind is Sri Lanka, Burma, Bangladesh, Pakistan, parts of Afghanistan, Nepal, India. This was known as Hind. And there was something very unique about Hind and Islamic knowledge. There's something very profound that Muhammad bin Qasim, who was a tabi'i, who went from the land of Islam and became the source of knowledge for that entire region known as Hind. And there's a reason why Rasulullah Sallam spoke and foretold of a war that will happen in Hind. He did not say India, he said Hind. But we'll get to that inshallah one day in the next 12 months. There was the colonization of this massive region by a handful of what we call poquito, small people. There was something that they did very interestingly. From Kabul to Delhi, scholars were hanged and burned throughout. Scholars of Islam, scholars who had light, scholars who empowered society, scholars who were able to take historical texts and bring relevancy to text and make the world grow were being killed. And as the author, Mulana Jafar Taniseri, Rahimahullah, writes in Kalapani, this incident known as Kalapani, they didn't beg for mercy. They died. In Kalapani, Islamic research, Islamic research, was thrown into the rivers to the extent that the water became black for months. All the ink turned the color of the water black. 
the missionary indoctrination and the colonizing aggression became rampant. It was around that time atheism was stuffed down Japan's throat, as I would say it. And a movement of spiritual emptiness began to revolve in our world. It began from the movement of colonization. You see, history is a very important part of our world. Quran is a chunk history. Yes or no? Why is Quran teaching us history? Because history is important to understand your present time. And if you understand history, you understand today. If you understand today, you will make better decisions for tomorrow. You know, they say we're doomed to repeat history because we never read our history. I'm not talking hundreds of years ago. This is less than 200 years ago. Right? After that, in 1863, the so-called English were defeated. But by that time, the goal was established. The goal was met. By the murder of scholars, the destruction of Islamic research texts, Islam as it used to be, and institutions as they used to function, change forever. Saharanpur, Deoband, Lucknow, some of the many great institutions that started in humble beginnings began to lose their track. Now one of the abilities that you may have, and Allah guide us, when you stop saying that I will do what my forefathers did, is to challenge the status quo of what we consider our institutions to be today. We are not created as Muslims to revere people and institutions regardless of how flawed they may be. We have a moral and spiritual responsibility to stand up and to ensure that our education is relevant, our empowerment is occurring, and that we are able to understand the world. It was around that same time uh, that the movement known as Wahhabism, which if you read up on Wahhabism, it has no roots to our Islamic tradition of the Prophet Muhammad Matter of fact, I give a kudos to Muhammad bin Salman because he said it in an interview that Wahhabism isn't something that was produced in Saudi, it was something that was introduced by the colonization of the British. Whatever we're going to talk tonight, and I'm going to give the disclaimer soon, but I'll give it now, we are not talking politics. We are not putting down faith. We are not inspiring for terrorism. We are learning history. And the facts are the facts. And I have homework for everyone. That all of you every month when we do a class will be assigned some homework to go and research brothers and sisters. It's time we started going back to libraries and picking up books and making knowledge in here. We store the knowledge in here, not on our smartphones, because time has come for knowledge to be manipulated and you won't even know it. So, what happened with the successful colonization of Ajam and Arab? Hind is Ajam. Hind is the non-Arab region where Islamic knowledge was very strong. And Arab, which is considered the area of Saudi Arabia, through the Lawrence of Arabia and everything else, we began producing cookie cutter scholars. And Islam changed forever. You can tell now if a, someone comes and gives a khutbah, if they're from Medina, Umm al Qura, if they're from Egypt, Al Azhar, or they're from Deoband, or they're from anywhere else. Why? There is a very unique tone that goes with people who have been educated in these places. That tone is, I will tell you what I learned, what I read, what I heard, and nothing more. Let us keep on talking, let us not think. What is the goal of this series, brothers and sisters? Our goal is to do what Islam told us to do. 
أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنِ Do they not ponder over the Qur'an? Do we not ponder and reflect what the Qur'an is telling me now? Brothers and sisters, by Allah, and I don't swear the name of Allah, but I'll say it today, by Allah, the Qur'an is speaking to you and I today, just as it spoke to the Sahaba at the time of Rasulullah Wasallam. It is alive, it's a miracle. But we have put on our earplugs, and we're just doing the rat, or reading it. Alhamdulillah, Ramadan, I finished four Qur'an. MashaAllah, very good. When is the ibadah? No one will downplay the ibadah. But when the ibadah overtakes everything, when you read it's ibadah, when you pray it's ibadah, when you reflect it's ibadah, when you think it's ibadah, when you study it is ibadah, but when you just say ibadah is reading, that's where it goes wrong. We are hoping that through this series, it inspires us to begin to ponder on what our deen told us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his guidance. Amin Rabbil Alameen. So in the course of this next 12, inshallah, months, I humbly request that people refrain from taking pictures or videos or audio recordings of what is being said here. We are not going to... And we're not uh, telling you to promote any discussions because each session will leave you hanging on certain discussions. And I don't want you going on saying, well, the Imam said this last night. No, we haven't completed the discussion. I will only permit for people to talk about this once they've understood the totality of what is being taught here. And so, inshallah, I'm hoping that this will just be live streamed for those tonight. We're not going to keep a recording of this. And again, as I said, we are not talking about politics. We are not talking about nations. We are not putting down rulers or leaders or anyone else. We are not putting down religions. And in no way, shape or form are we inciting people towards terrorism. What are we trying to accomplish here, brothers and sisters? Through the light of Qur'an, inshallah, I'm hoping that all of you, beyond this, will be able to do tafsir like this. Tafsir, where the Qur'an where the sabab bin nuzul which means why it was revealed, the ahadith, the text of Rasulullah Sallallahu the history, the ancient text, all loop together for tafsir inshallah. Tafsir cannot be a translation and a discussion. Yusuf I saw went running from her and he ran through 12 doors and the door handle was on the right side but some people say it was on the left side, some say it was higher, some say it was lower. We don't want to know this stuff, this is good. But this isn't our Qur'an. Our Qur'an will tell us a miracle of what Yusuf did when he ran from his carnal desires, which he himself stated he is not free from. وَمَا أُبَرِّئُ نَفْسِي And that is why Rasulullah Sallallahu said that there will be seven categories of people under the shade of Allah's throne on the day that there will be no shade. Two of them fit the category of Yusuf Ali Islam. A youngster, a youth, shabun, nasha'a fi ibadatillah. A youth who grew up in Allah's worship and someone who was seduced by a beautiful woman and said, I fear Allah. Do you understand how this story has much more bigger implications than just the story itself? So what are the three things that we want to discuss? What are the three things we're going to cover under the context of Ya'ju, uh, uh, sorry, Zulkarni, number one everyone. Have you heard the name Dajjal? How many of us could stand up right now and say, I have a lot of understanding and knowledge about Dajjal. I have researched this topic to the extent that I can even tell you where I feel he is right now. Is he alive or not? What is it? Or do we just say Dajjal is that triangle on the top of the one dollar bill? Hmm? It's a topic that no one talks about. Could anyone here put their hand up and say that there was a khutbah given here in the last 15 years about Dajjal? That there was a topic discussion on Dajjal anywhere? A very in-depth analysis? Now, what is so important about Dajjal? Let us read this hadith. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, I warn you of him, there has not been a prophet except he warned his people and Nuh indeed warned his people. This hadith is in Jamit Tirmidhi in Kitab al Fitan. I want you to focus on the highlighted part. Rasulullah is saying to this Ummah, I am warning you of the Dajjal. There has been no prophet that came before me, but they warned their people of the Dajjal. 
If we talk about aqidah and faith, we say we bring faith on Allah and all His messengers, yes? We bring faith in Isa, Islam, yes or no? And what was revealed to Isa, Islam, yes or no? We bring faith on Musa, Islam, yes or no? And what was revealed to Musa, Islam, yes or no? We bring all that faith. So if you believe that your Islam, an integral part of it, is to believe these messengers and what was revealed to these messengers, then one of the most common thread that unites all messengers beyond Tawheed and Risala is this warning. It was when I started this research, I realized why Rasulullah Sallallahu is called Nadira. Nadira, the warner, the warner. Why is Rasulullah Sallallahu a warner? When he's brought something so beautiful, if you live that, you shouldn't care about anything else. You're going to do good. But he was a warner. What does a warner mean? He is warning you of something. His first message my brothers and sisters, what was his first message? He warned the people of Quraysh of an army coming. His first message was negative. When Allah sent him to speak about Islam to his people, he said, I'm warning you of an army. If I told you there was an army, would you believe me? Yes or no? Rasulullah Sallam by default is a warner. Because all prophets were a warner. And they warned their people of something known as Dajjal. What is the name of it? Dajjal. So my question then becomes, every messenger alayhim salatu wassalam spoke about Dajjal and today the ummah of Rasulullah s.a.w. doesn't speak about Dajjal. Doesn't know about Dajjal. When Rasulullah said, when the Dajjal fitna happens, lock your women in the houses. Because he will first target the women. He said that, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that when you see the Dajjal, run the opposite way. Doesn't matter how strong your faith is. He will trick you like that. And you will lose your faith like that. But why should we talk about it? When we talk about the signs of day judgment, we say something's going to happen. When it happens, let it happen. That is exactly the mindset of the cookie cutter Islamic system in our world today. When are you going to get a job? When I get a degree. When are you going to get a degree? Oh, when Allah wants me to. Sit in your mother's basement till you're 90 years old. When Allah wants me to. Everyone in this world comes, plans, and they execute and they get. Yes or no? Why isn't this ummah talking about the fundamental message that every messenger gave. That's the first thing we want to address, inshallah. That's one of the three things we want to address. Number two, who's the most controversial person in this world? Does anyone know who he is? Who's the most controversial person in our world till today? Isa alayhi salam. You go to a black church, you may see a black Jesus. You go to a white church, you'll see a white Jesus. You go to a Catholic church, you'll see Mary and Jesus. To some, Jesus is the Son of God. To some, Jesus is God. To some, Jesus is a messenger of God. How can this one brother sitting in front of me here have so many roles and so many colors and so many names and so many titles? How is it possible? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, chapter 4, verse number 157 and 158, This one ayah, brothers and sisters, will take us two sessions to the tafsir on. وَقَوْلِهِمْ إِنَّا قَتَلَّ الْمَسِيحَ عِيسَى بْنَ مَرْيَمَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا صَلَبُوهُ وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَ لَهُمْ وَإِنَّ الَّذِينَ اخْتَلَفُوا فِيهِ لَفِي شَكٍّ مِّنْ مَا لَهُمْ بِهِ مِنْ عِلْمٍ إِلَّا اتِّبَاعَ الظَّنْ وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ يَقِيلًا بَلْ رَفَعَهُ اللَّهُ إِلَيْهِ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ عَزِيزًا حَكِيمًا In each word of this verse, there is a discussion that could be written in chapters. There are Muslims today who don't even know and who don't even believe. There's those who don't know and there's those who don't believe that Jesus, peace be upon him, is going to return. There are some Muslims in the world today that believe that Jesus is dead. 
And if you believe Jesus is dead or Jesus is not going to return السلام, then your Islam is flawed. The most controversial person in our world today that he is mentioned in our Quran more than Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam but many who claim to follow the Islam and know the Islam and practice the Islam don't know this person. So they're saying that we have killed Messiah, the Jesus, son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. Allah is saying they did not kill him, they did not crucify him, but someone else was made to resemble him. And indeed those who differ over it are in doubt about it. Even those who differ about it are in doubt of it. They do not have no knowledge except they follow assumption. And Allah says they did not kill him for certain. Allah raised him to himself and Allah is exalted and mighty and wise. Now see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says they have no knowledge of him except they follow assumption. This is where this inshallah journey is going to be unique. We are going to inshallah analyze the Bible, the Old Testament, the New Testament and then the Final Testament. The biggest problem today is when we talk about a topic, we talk about it from the angle of our text. You can never learn from your text alone. You need to take other people's text and validate your text. Do you understand what I'm saying? I cannot say, well, our Quran says this. Our Quran says Jesus isn't the Son of God. Yes or no? But then people say the Bible says Jesus is the Son of God. So there's never going to be a common ground. But when you take their book, when you take their reference point, which we believe in is the revelation of Allah in its true form, and we apply it to the Qur'an. And then we take history and we apply it to the Qur'an, we will inshallah have a bigger picture of understanding. Say inshallah. So, first one that is causing us to go on this journey is the Dajjal. The second one is who? Isa Islam. And the third and final. Rasulullah sallallahu one day told the Sahaba Hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim Reference point is on the bottom Allah will say, O oh Adam What do we say after his name? Alayhi salam He will say, Labayk Allah, I am here Wal khaira kullahu biyadayk Allah, all good is in your hand Allah will say to Adam Abu al-Bashar, the father of human race Bring forth those who are going to help. O oh Adam, yes, I'm here. Bring forth those who will go to help. Why is Allah asking Adam Islam? See, this is the questions we don't talk about. These are questions we don't ask. We could say we memorize a thousand hadith, but we won't ask a question on the hadith. Who are the people that Adam's being told to bring? Adam is being told to bring from his progeny, from his children. Is he going to go to Mars and bring some aliens? He's bringing from his progeny. Who are they? Allah will say, remember this word here everyone, from every thousand nine hundred and ninety-nine. Everyone say this, from every thousand nine hundred and ninety-nine. O oh Adam, yes Allah, bring the people for help. Who are they, Allah? Allah says to him, from each thousand nine hundred and ninety-nine. From your progeny. From whose progeny? Adam and Islam's progeny. Which means that there are a people that have spanned from the time of Adam Islam's progeny which I would resort more to Nuh salam because the world was destroyed and we started Nuh salam is known as Adam Thani, the second Adam salam and these people continued and they will continue till the day of judgment if they were only from this Ummah Allah would have said, Oh Muhammad Yes, Allah, bring the people of hell. Who are they, Allah? Out of every thousand nine hundred ninety-nine. Meaning from your ummah. But he's telling Adam, 
At that time, Rasulullah said, at that point, young will turn gray, every pregnant female will abort, people will seem intoxicated, but they're not. Allah's punishment is severe. The Sahaba became so scared. Are you not scared hearing this? Yes or no? If there is going to be 999 of every thousand going to hell, what chance do I have? None. I'll tell you, I have no chance. If 999 are going to hell and one's going to heaven, I'm not going to be that person. I can. So Sahaba asked Rasulullah who will be that one? Who will be that one? And so he said, See how the Sahaba asked? They didn't want to get caught up with the big thing. They want to know the intricacies. Who's that one? Who is that one that I can be that one? Not who are the 999 that I could say I'm not a part of. And so he said, be good, cheer. I abshiru, take it easy, Have, be happy. There will be one man from amongst you and 1,000 amongst Ya'juj and Ma'juj. What is the name of them, everyone? Ya'juj and Ma'juj. I.e., there will be one from you. There will be one from the pure human race, and there will be the 999 from the manipulated human race. See, hadith are not discussed like this anymore, brothers and sisters. And I'm not going to sit here claiming that I know everything. But what I'm going to say is you and I need to start thinking outside the box. Because our religion is profound. Our religion is amazing. Our religion is actually speaking what's happening in this world today. And he said, By the one in whose hand is my soul, I hope you will be a quarter of the people of paradise. The Sahaba said, what everyone? Allahu Akbar. They said, I hope you'll be a third of the people of paradise. He said, Allahu Akbar. Now he's saying, you are saying that your ummah, this ummah, we will be a quarter. No, we will be a third. And then he says, no, I pray and I hope you will be half of the people of paradise. That this ummah of Rasulullah Sallallahu will be half of the inhabitants of paradise. Say, Allahu Akbar. This is amazing. Out of this whole Jannah that's going to be for the millions and billions of people, half of this Jannah will be the ummah of Rasulullah. This is the dua of Rasulullah He is making dua for you Make sure every time Adhan is called You make dua for him May Allah give him that top point of the diamond That one exclusive That one exclusive paradise Which is reserved for one of Allah's noble servants And may that be our Habib Muhammad Pray for him and inshallah He will intercede for you tomorrow So there are three things that we're talking about, brothers. Again, brothers and sisters, who is this Dajjal? Do you think we should know this, yes or no? Who is this Gog and Magog? Do you think we should know this, yes or no? Until now, this is what's the discussion on the streets of Islam. Dajjal is a system. Dajjal is this invisible force. It's on the streets that Gog and Magog are like these gremlins. You know, gremlins or these cabbage patch kids. And they're going to come running out everywhere And they're going to be eating everything up And that's what the hadith says So if you've ever heard a discussion on Gog and Magog I'm sure or I'm confident The picture that's in your head There's some type of beast The like cockroaches huh? And the Dajjal is some type of system A global system A new world order system All these theories No substance and that Isa is just a prophet. When Isa is going to come down, that's when Mehdi will already have started his work. Before that time, the Jal's work would have been done. Isa will be there. Mehdi will be there. The Jal will be there. How do you know who is who? Hmm? No one will be able to tell. If you do not work to understand who is who, you won't understand who is who. And the Dajjal will also have uh, a type of hair and power that people will assume him to be the Jesus. Hmm? 
He has curly hair, but he will then control the earth. He will have certain powers, and uh, he will have one eye. Is that metaphorical or is that literal? You know, when we're talking about one eye, then Rasulullah says one eye will be swelled up like a grape. What is going on here? I think I should know something. That's my claim. Now, let us begin with this point. We all say that Anbiya alayhi wasallam came to explain who Allah was, right? People worship idols, they forgot Allah, the prophets came back to teach people who Allah was. Yes? And this is what we always say, that prophets came to remind people their purpose of existence, who Allah is, to worship Allah and gain success in this world and the next. But this is a very shallow understanding of who Allah is and why Allah was sent a prophet. Because remember, Quraysh worshipped idols, the majority of them. Yes or no? They were idol worshippers. Did they believe in Allah? Did they believe in Allah? Yes. Yes. They worshipped idols, but they believed in Allah. They worshipped 300 plus idols, but they believed in Allah. Their only thing was, you are not good enough to talk to Allah. You need to go through the system. You have to go through the idols, and then that and Uzzah will communicate it to Allah. You can't talk to Allah. So, the Prophet didn't just come to introduce Allah. Allah has introduced Himself, yes or no? The Quran says, وَفِي أَنفُسِكُمْ In your own body is signs of Allah's power. The manifestation of Allah's power is in you, yes or no? وَفِي أَنفُسِكُمْ Look in yourself, you'll know Allah exists. The way your body functions, your cells, your nervous system, the way your lungs function alone, these are signs Allah exists. Someone asked Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, if Allah didn't send prophets, would Allah hold people accountable? He said yes. Because Allah gave enough signs for people to know that they are here for a reason, and there's someone who created them, and there's someone who created this all, and their mere submission to that power would be sufficient for their salvation. But you have to be truly arrogant and then ignorant to have the word in front of you and not know who Allah is. To have the religion to follow the path and not get to the destination. Islam is a path. Ihdina, ihdina, mustaqim. Allah show me the path so what? I can sit on the path and have a picnic? So I can sit on the path and just watch the deers knock me over? No, so I can walk the path. I can trek the path. My understanding, Allah sent prophets to introduce Allah because if you know who Allah is, you will know who Allah isn't. And who is that? Dajjal. Because Dajjal will claim to be God Himself. And many will fall to His words. Dajala, Dajala, which is the three letters that make the master in root of the Dajjal, means deception. Allah gave you and I a religion to see beyond deception. For deceptions will deceive your eyes, and Quran will guide your heart. When your heart is guided, your eyes will follow your heart. When your hearts are not guided and your hearts do not have the eyes, you will be at the mercy of what you see. You will see a magician cut a person in half and you will believe that happened. It is called dajala. It's called deception. It's a mirage. It's like in the heat of Texas, you see water on the road. But when you get there, there's no water. So the prophet, if every prophet warned their people of the Dajjal, they came to introduce Allah so that the people, by understanding Allah, will know that this thing is not Allah, i.e. Dajjal. 
by understanding why we are here and what our needs are on this earth, we will prevent ourselves from the slips and the mishap and the derailment of our life that will take us to Him. When Allah says, don't do this, don't listen to music, Islam teaches us, don't listen to music, don't drink alcohol, don't fornicate, don't do wrong, don't lie, don't kill. Why? Because these things don't hurt Allah, brothers and sisters. They don't hurt Allah one bit. Sahabas were Muslims and they were drinking in Mecca. Yes or no? They were drinking in Medina. Yes or no? This was okay. It wasn't that these things hurt Allah. Why is my religion so hard? It doesn't allow me to have fun. No. Your religion wants you to stay away from the path that leads to the deceiver. And your religion wants you to stay on a path through actions that will keep you on the true Allah's path. Look at religion from a different angle, brothers and sisters. We see religion as a dictatorship now on us. As our kids see it. Why do I have to fast in Ramadan? I have my final. Allah told you to fast. If you don't fast, you're going to hellfire. Oh, brothers and sisters, our religion is so great. It's beyond this. Religion is a prescription, a method of saving yourself from the jal. Does everyone understand my point? The jal is real. His deception is real. Every prophet warned their people of him. He didn't come in any of the Prophet's time. He is coming in the Ummah of Rasulullah He will come in our time, meaning in this Ummah's time. So, the question then becomes, that why isn't the world worried about this? Forget the Muslim world, the non-Muslim world should be worried also, right? Everyone should be worried. There's this thing called a deceiver because Jesus, peace be upon him, warned his people. Musa Islam warned his people. So why are we people talking about it? Because there has been a very unique shift, a paradigm shift in the minds of people. That what is evil has now been made to seem beautiful. Very slowly, slowly, minds have been changed because the world is about the mind. The world isn't about the heart. Islam is about the heart. Control the heart, control your mind. Control the mind, lose your heart. You understand? Because there is a assumption that this coming Messiah is what the Judaic promise is of who people think is Jesus. The Jews are saying Jesus is coming because Jesus didn't come yet. The Messiah is coming. The Jews are saying, Messiah is coming. The Christians are saying, Jesus is coming. And so, this entity that's coming has been made to be assumed as a religious, noble, godly figure. How can you have beef with Santa Claus? Look, all he does is he intrudes your house, cuts off your alarm system, eats your cookies, and he gives you some gifts. How could you have beef with Santa Claus? Right? He's a jolly man. One indoctrination of such changes how you assume and see people. So, the Christians are working, and hear me out very clearly, the Christians globally are working towards the arrival of Jesus. This is their work. And I am not speaking bad. I do interfaith work. I have a lot of Christian allies and friends in the city and around the world, alhamdulillah. But there's one thing they will not deny. They are working towards the return of Jesus Christ. The Jews are working diligently towards the return of the Messiah. Yes or no? It's a fact. And the Muslims were told to work towards preparing for the emergence of Dajjal so you will know who is Dajjal and who is Jesus and who is the true Messiah. Who is the false Messiah? Who is the true Messiah? Because your Islam told you to follow the true Messiah. And the true Messiah will say, I am no longer a prophet of God. I am a follower of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Bring me the Quran. But by then, the deception will already have played out. 
If it was Allah's mercy on us, He would have sent Jesus first. And Jesus would have done a global presidential campaign to tell the people, I am Jesus. And then Allah would have sent Dajjal. But Allah will send Dajjal first. And then He will send Jesus because there has not been a test on this earth more severe than the test of Dajjal. And if you don't understand, brothers and sisters, what I'm trying to say to you, we or our children or our grandchildren will be tested by the greatest test to ever occur on this earth. Those who succeed will be like the Sahaba, and those who fail will be like the Pharaoh and Abu Jal. May Allah protect us from that. Say, I mean, I mean. So the Jews are working to the return of the Messiah. The Christians are working to the return of Jesus, and the Muslims are working towards. It's Tarawi 8 Rakat to 20 to 20. That's what we're working towards right now. We have a great agenda, brothers and sisters. We're so busy figuring out what time Fajr begins, and which Rakat to pray when, and what is Sunnah, and what is Bidah. We're really good, aren't we, brothers and sisters? This is called the deception of an Ummah. The a whole Ummah of one of the greatest prophets, Rasulullah Sallam, cannot think the same, cannot focus the same, cannot educate the same, because we're distracted. The world isn't worried because the figure has been made to be noble. And who's going to make this all happen? We'll be covering this, inshallah. So, what are the three discussion topics, everyone? Number one is Isa Islam. Number two is the Antichrist, the Jal. And number three is Gog and Magog. Inshallah, in the next 12 months, we will be covering all of these things, inshallah. So today we're going to go with the Isa Islam. Before we do Isa Islam, we're going to start. This is going to be part one of nine parts on Jesus, peace be upon him. And in Isa Islam, we're going to cover from the Quran, from the Hadith, from the Torah, from the Injil, and from history, inshallah. A very wholesome coverage of who this person is, inshallah. That being said, my research from 2011 till now, limited research has brought me to this conclusion thus far that I believe this is what the world is about thus far I may be wrong and I hope that there's someone who could bring to me knowledge and say Imam you are wrong matter of fact I researched and I found out this because that's exactly what our Quran came to do remember our deen is about thinking do you all remember what happened when Ida Ja and Rasulullah he was, was revealed? Rasulullah Sassam was sitting with the Sahaba and this verse was revealed. And then he said to the Sahaba, What does this chapter, this surah mean? Many of the noble pioneer Sahaba are sitting around him in a circle. So all of them gave their opinion of what this surah meant. What this is teaching us, brothers and sisters, is you need to think what the surah is telling you, not just read what the surah is saying. So all the Sahaba said something that they thought, and there was one little boy. Do you know what his name was? What was his name? I heard it. Abdullah ibn Abdullah ibn Ab Abbas. Ibn Abbas, the son of Abbas عنه, the son of Abbas he said, Ya Rasulullah this surah is telling you that your time is coming to an end and that you make istighfar because you're going to go back to Allah and the big sahabas are like, okay the kid speaking Rasulullah said he's telling the truth he knows it Rasulullah didn't make hafiz of Qur'an, he didn't make alims of deen, he made thinkers, think. So based on my research till now, after Nuh alayhi salam, after a while came Sulaiman alayhi salam, there was Dawud alayhi salam, just skipping through, there was Sulaiman alayhi salam, everyone knows who Sulaiman alayhi salam is, right? There's something about Sulaiman alayhi salam and his kingdom, a prophet who had a kingdom, a kingdom the like of no one else, why did he have such a kingdom? Because something called the Jal emerged in his time in the physical form. And then came Gog and Magog at that time. And then came Zulqarnayn. Someone you and I would have not known about in the Quran unless Allah's decree was that Quraysh sent a delegation to Medina to ask the pioneer, senior, scholarly Jews how do we prove that this prophet is a liar? And one of the questions they asked to ask Muhammad was what? 
Zulkarnay. Why is Aluna Khan Zulkarnay? Ya Rasulullah, they're asking about Zulkarnay. Quraysh is asking you because the Jews told them to ask you to prove that you're not a prophet. So Zulkarnay came, after which Isa Islam came, after which Muhammad Islam came. Do you see this line right here? I believe the beginning of Nubuwa was the beginning of Gog and Magog. The re-emergence of Gog and Magog. And the Jal will come, Gog and Magog will come, the Jal will emerge in its physical form, Isai Islam will come, Gog and Magog will have their final say, and then after that will be Day of Judgment. This summary, this picture depicts what my research told me. I may be wrong, and I'll be okay if I'm wrong. But what I want you and I to do is research and find out what is the truth. And the knowledge we have gives us the truth. So, today we are starting with Isa Yes or no? We are going to be going to the Bible and the Quran to bring forth a clear understanding of who he is, inshallah. Seven parts including this one, inshallah. So brothers and sisters, before the Christians used to say the Muslims don't believe in Jesus. You heard that, right? And matter of fact, when the Quraysh went to uh, Abyssinia and met with King Negus, when they failed the first time to get those Arabs back, they went the next day and said, what to King Negus? Could someone tell me? What did they say to King Najashi? The first day they went and said, these are renegades, these are pirates from our city, they're criminals, we need to take them back. If you don't remember, our first hijra was where? Abyssinia. Muslims didn't migrate to Medina first. They migrated to the Medina second. The first migration happened to Abyssinia. And when they went, Quraysh sent a delegation to grab them and bring them back. But they already went to a Christian king known as Negus. Najashi. And what happened was they said, we need to bring them back. They gave gifts of leather to ministers and to the kings and all the stuff that, you know, you know what the pharmaceutical companies do today? You know that type of thing, you know? They, they, they just give people things, make them happy. And they say, King, we need them back. King said, no, they're in my protection. That night, those Quraysh leaders said, if we go back empty-handed, we'll be shamed. What can we say to Negus that will provoke him to let these people out? So they went back the next day and they said, Oh, King Najashi, we're on our way out. But we just want to let you know that these people don't believe in Jesus like you believe in Jesus. When someone attacks your faith personally, you become defensive. Oh, they don't. Call them. One of the Sahabis, I want you to tell me his name, inshallah, next month. He recited which surah? Surah Maryam. And when he recited the verse of Surah Maryam, Negus cried and he said, Stop. This is the truth. This is the truth. So as Muslims began in the West saying that we believe in Jesus also, the word now in churches is, you don't believe in the same Jesus that we believe in. You don't believe in the same Jesus. Your Jesus is different. You got this, this fantasy Jesus. We got the real Jesus. So what are we going to do? We're going to use the Bible and the Quran to make sure that he's one in the same Jesus. Say inshallah. So with that, what is his name? Now since it's already 1007, we're going to go through this not fast, but we're going to cover the main parts. Have you guys seen that fish symbol before? So this fish symbol stands for... Jesus, Christos, Theos, Dios, and Soter, which means Jesus Christ, Son of God, our Savior. Right? It means Jesus Christ, Son of God, our Savior. See this word right here? Jesus. 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 The name of Jesus in the coin language, which was a type of dialect that the Greeks used in the Byzantine era, uh, it was. Iso, Aiso, Aisos. It was spelled like Aisos, it was Aiso. Right? That's how you pronounce it. But they took this spelling and they pronounced it as Yeshua. What they pronounce it as everyone? Yeshua. Like San Jose is to not San Jose. They say San Jose or island is not Iceland. It is island. What happened is that they took this original word and they pronounced it as Yeshua and the English spelling of Yeshua originated in the early 1950s 
And then they claim that Yeshua was the word or the name given to Jesus. So we don't even have the right name to discuss. His name is not Jesus. His name is not Jesus. The original word Aisus, Aisus is the same as Ya'isa. Everyone say Ya'isa. Aisu. Ya'isa. Aisus. This is the same word, but they slowly with time changed that word to sound like something else, and they took that sound of the word and said that was a given name to the man named Jesus. Quran restores his original name. His name is Isa. His name is not Jesus. His name is not Yeshua. His name is Isa. So the first thing you and I need to understand from history and from the translation is that Jesus is not a name of that prophet. His name is Isa. And this comes from the Greek dialect. And the question I ask is, why was his name written in Greek? Was that the language of the Bible? Let's find out. The Bible, the text, was in Biblical Hebrew, or known as Classical Hebrew. And some portions were in Aramaic. Do you rem could you remember these two languages? Hebrew and Aramaic. Aramaic is a uh, Semitic language which has, is a Syrian dialect uh, which was used back in the days. It was in 50 to 100 years after the departure of Jesus, peace be upon him, that the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, was translated into Greek. Is everyone with me on this? After Isa, the Hebrew slash Aramaic Bible was translated into Greek, right? During the first century, Greeks remain, Greek remained the language of the small Christian community, but then it began to spread. And thus, a Latin version of the Bible became common in the western regions such as Rome. Is everyone with me still? Now what happened was, in the fourth century, they continued to corrupt these versions. And in the fourth century, in the words of St. Jerome, who was the leading biblical scholar of that time, he states, and these are his words, there were almost as many texts as there were manuscripts. Aramaic Hebrew Bible, the Torah, the Torah, right? Sorry, the, the Bible. It was translated into Greek within the first century. But then four centuries on, the Latin translation which became to be because of Christianity spread, it became as confusing as there were the manuscripts. You couldn't tell which one was the tafsir and which one was the Qur'an, if that makes sense, right? So what happened in 382, the Pope Damascus, he commissioned Jerome to find the definite Latin version, I want the right Latin version. I don't, your job is to go find the right Latin version. There's a million and one Latin versions now, and I want you to go find the right one. So in his monastery in Bethlehem, he started to produce what would be the Latin version. And this Latin version eventually became the staple of the church until the church was reformed. So let me put it to you like this. This is what happened. The Bible was in what language, everyone? Hebrew and Aramaic. Translated first in the first century into what language? Greek. But then in fourth century, it became Latin because of the spread. And this guy was told to figure out literally what happened. There were hundreds of copies of manuscripts in Latin, and he was told to find the right one. He just went like this. This is the right one. That's the right one. Because they didn't have the time to research and cross-reference. And this is so important to know because the Qur'an, when it became a written book, it went through so much rigorous, 
What did they do? The process. Every, many of the Sahabas had personal Qur'an. Remember when Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu was going to kill Rasulullah sallam, and he was told, go fix your own sister, she's a Muslim. What did he find in her hand? A manuscript of the Qur'an, what she had written. They were scribes who Rasulullah sallam had designated their job was to write the Qur'an. That's all their job was. But there was people who had their personal Qur'an, those manuscripts. The hiv, the memorization, and the personal copies were brought together at the time of, of, of Umar radiallahu the, 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 the concept started flirting at the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, but Abu Bakr radiallahu anh didn't have the time to make this happen. So Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anh took this on. Uthman radiallahu anh completed it. And when the version of the Quran was confirmed, this was after taking all the people, new people had written and the scribe, and making sure the Quran was one. Why? Because Allah said He's going to protect it. So we believe Allah through this process protected the Qur'an. The Qur'an has not been changed a single dot. Remember this. Although dots were added after. But those dots were added for the same pronunciation. So, what happened then? In 1611, let's fast forward. In 1611, the Bible received a translation into English from Latin. Which year? 1611. How many years after Jesus? 1600 years after that. How many years after the Latin translation was affirmed? 1200 years. Okay? The Bible was composed of a total of 80 books. The last 14 books are not in the Bible today. And they used to compose the end of the Old Testament. In the year 1684, those books were removed from the version of what is today's Bible. This all happened at the hand of what we call the Catholic Church. And you may be saying, why do we need to learn all this? It's all going to make sense at the end, inshallah. So again, quickly, Bible was in Hebrew and... Aramaic, translated into Greek, then into Latin, then there was a mix-up. Then after that, it came to English in the 1600s. All 80 of the decided upon Latin version. But then they minus 14 of them. And that is what we have today as the base of the Bible. As the base of the Bible. The Bible is still changing. Those 14 books are right in front of you. The 14 books that are not in the Bible today are in front of you. In essence, the time, I don't want to start reading through them, but that is there in front of you. Moving forward. Now, we all can agree on one thing, brothers and sisters. The Bible is severely flawed, unfortunately. Yes or no? Think about it. Don't blame a Christian. Don't blame the religion now. There was a systematical downfall from that time, a manipulation that led to a book of Allah being removed, tampered, changed, altered, thrown out, and we have what we have today. Now, as, as, as manipulated the book is, that is how manipulated the mindset of Christians are when it comes to Jesus. Do you think all Christians believe Jesus in the same way? Many of us might. No? That's good. Well, just look here quickly. I can't go through all of them because we have a lot to cover. The Catholics believe he is God, the Son who became man for us. I can't explain this. I just need you to understand. I cannot explain this. I'm not a Christian scholar. The Baptists believe he is one God and the human and divine nature of Jesus Christ. The Mormons believe under the direction of the Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ created the earth. So now we're, we're seeing in the Mormons that God, under His order, Jesus made the earth. So Jesus played the role of God because God told Him to. See the difference in three so far? This is just three. We haven't gone on yet. The Protestants, as Christians, they believe in God and Jesus. They believe in two separate. Then we go to the Jehovah Witness, the Orthodox the Lutherans, the Anglicans, the Presbyterians, the United Methodists, the Evangelicals. I want to point out two of these. The Orthodox Christians believe in a single God who is both three and one, triune, i.e. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one in essence and undivided. They believe that dual nature of Christ 
they're saying that God is three, but perfectly three, and Jesus is two and perfectly two. They believe Jesus is 100% God and 100% human. This is orthodox. And I want us to focus on evangelicals because they are the front runners in our world today. The evangelicals believe God is the Son. God the Son became flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. Well, so I'm not going to use the word Trinity. I'm going to say Triune. Triune means that the all three are harmoniously one. Not one is three. And that's why I use the word right here, Triune. So now what we're hearing is, so far, brothers and sisters, can you tell me, does that sound problematic, yes or no? If Jesus comes, for those who believe Jesus will come, to some in that faith he'll be a God. To some he'll be a prophet. To some he'll be a return. To some he'll be God, the Holy Spirit, and the Savior all in one. This is very confusing. Why did Allah give us Islam to the world? Not to you, to the world. To clarify. Allah said in the Quran, and we have sent down that would clarify those matters that you differ in. The world was already believing in the Trinity concept when Rasulullah Sallam came. 600 years on, the Trinity concept had already started. That's what Allah said in the Quran. وَلَا تَقُولُوا ثَلَاثَ Don't say three. إِنْتَهُوا Stop. خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ This is good for you. إِنَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَهُ وَاحِدٌ Allah is one God. سُبْحَانَهُ أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُ وَلَدٌ How can Allah have a child? For Him belongs everything in the heavens and the earth. So what the Qur'an came to do wasn't to start a new religion, but it was to rectify, solidify, and to remove the doubts and the concepts and the theories that were created so people could believe in that one message, that Allah is one. And so thus in the banner or under the umbrella of Christianity, there is as much confusion in the person of Christ as there is in the word of Christ. Yes or no? In Islam we believe what? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent him down, who? Isa Islam as a prophet. He is not God. He is not the Lord. And nor is he the son of God. Now, according to some, they believe that his birth happened. This is in the Gospels. Everyone heard what the Gospels are? Have you heard the Gospels? The word Gospels before? Gospels are known as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These documents were named after being found anywhere between 66 to 110 years after Jesus, peace be upon him, and they were considered to be a part of the Bible. Have you noticed in the Bible talks about Jesus' life, a lot of it? Does the Quran talk a lot about Muhammad's life, yes or no? Does the Quran talk about Muhammad's life, yes or no? Very little. Very little. But the Bible talks a lot about Jesus' daily life. The Hadith talks about Rasulullah's life. The Quran does it. Quran mentions them only five times. The Quran talks about a war, talks about the conditions of a war. It doesn't talk, the Quran isn't a biography of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Do you understand what I'm saying? But the Bible is like a biography of Jesus, peace be upon him. You know why? Because there were documents found over 50 years after, and they said this is what Jesus was, and we're going to put it into the Bible. Who is the author? What is the legitimacy of these, legitimacy of these documents? No one knows. And so it was added to what is considered the Bible. The Gospels are not the Bible. And so in the Gospels, we find about Jesus having a father who is Joseph. Uh, and, and, and it goes on. It's a very derogatory thing to say. Some say that Maryam alayhi salam, na'udhu billah, committed zina. Yes or no? They say that. That she committed zina. And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Wa mutahhiruka. Allah is going to bring you and purify you. That notion that he is waladu zina, the son of adultery, Allah will purify that. But there is a very unique sect of the Christianity that is leading that message. And they are the people who Allah will ask Isai Islam on the Day of Judgment. What will Allah say to Isai Islam on the Day of Judgment? Anta. 
انت قلت للناس اتخذوني وامي الهين من دون الله الله will say oh jesus peace be upon it did you tell the people to worship you and your mom as god beside me there's only one group of christianity that worships mary and i'm not going to go into it yet it's coming but you may already know who they are they are in rome they're in a city known as the vatican a country sorry a country vatican is a country if you do not know vatican is a country of its own it is only the catholics the roman catholics that believe in mary as a deity or a revered person more than any other christians do so anyway their concept is saint joseph fathered jesus what do we believe brothers and sisters our children are here tonight teach your children teach yourself Allah created Jesus peace be upon him like he created Adam alayhi salam yes or no Allah created Adam alayhi salam without a father and mother Allah created Isa alayhi salam without a father if Allah can create Jesus without a father and mother uh, sorry Isa uh, Adam alayhi salam without a father and a mother how come it's difficult in the eyes of people that Allah would create Jesus without a father it's easy for Allah he did it وَرُوحٌ مِّنْ Allah put the soul into Jesus, peace be upon him. Allah made Maryam a.s. through his hukum to become pregnant. She then became pregnant when the angel told her that you're going to have a son. She said, how can I have a son? No man has touched me. You see, every word of the Quran is answering the false notions in our world. When they say Joseph is the father of Jesus, she said it, no man has touched me. The Quran is answering all the faults that's in this world. But how would we know that when we don't even know the story? How will we value the words of the Quran, which each word is giving us an answer for a predicament that is existing in our world? That's what Allah said, that they rejected faith and they uttered against Mary a grave and false charge that she did zina. Now brothers and sisters, Isa alayhi salam in Christianity is many people and many things. In Islam, the same Allah that sent Isa alayhi salam to those people is saying he is one. He is the son of Maryam alayhi salam. He is a prophet and a messenger. He has been risen and he'll be sent down. Yes or no? Simple. Right? He did miracles. He brought life to death. He made a bird and it became a bird in the sand. It became real. With whose permission? Allah's permission. Today, many in the Christian community claim to have the healing powers of Jesus inherited from Jesus because Jesus healed and we heal. But Isa Alaihissalam said, "I do it bi idnillah wa ubri ul akmah wa al abrasa wa ufi al mauta bi idnillah." I bring life back to death. I heal the leopard and the blind with the command of Allah. And every prophet's miracle was only as good as their time. Their time left, their miracles finished, yes or no? But there's one miracle that one prophet was given that lives till today. Does anyone know what it is? Please tell me. The Holy Quran given to who? The Prophet Muhammad wasallam. It's a living miracle. It's a living miracle. That's why this Quran, we cannot allow our next generation to abandon the Quran. I pray they abandon the false culture surrounding our Islam, but they cling on to the Quran. Because I promise you, the more you research this book, the more you will find amazement in it. So what I'm going to do now is a side-by-side -side comparison of the Bible, i.e. the New Testament and the Qur'an to prove that he's the same person. Is everyone with me? We need to know first if he's the same person. So quickly, it says in Luke that she gave birth to a child. The Qur'an says that Maryam Islam, she went away from the community, she sat by a palm tree and she gave birth to a child. So far it looks the same. Yes or no everyone? Let's stay awake here. Yes or no? Same? Okay. So he was born. He didn't fall from the sky. The Bible in Luke chapter 1 verse 6 and 7 says it. The Quran chapter 19 verse 22, 25 says it. Very good. Number two, that he is a prophet. Just to make sure. 
that he is the same person that the Christians claim, that we as Muslims claim. And also to make sure that he's a human and he's not God. Let's continue. They said in Luke, and you're reading it, that they were all filled with awe and praised God. And they said, and I quote, a great prophet has appeared amongst us. Where is that everyone? In the... In the Bible. And what happened here in the Quran? Jesus said, O oh, children of Israel, I am the messenger of Allah sent to you. So he's a prophet in Islam, yes or no? And the Bible says that the people called him a prophet, yes or no? So he's human, born, and he's a prophet. What else do we know? He was sent by Allah. In John we learned that he said, I have not come on my own, but he sent me. Who sent him? DHL or FedEx, who sent him? Allah sent him, yes? Everyone stay awake, Allah sent him. And in the Quran, it tells that Isa السلام, was nothing but than a messenger of Allah and Allah's word that Allah has sent down. I forgot to write the end of that verse. Moving along. He didn't come here to fulfill his agenda, but the will of Allah. We see in John, he says, I have come not to do my will, but to do the will of the one who sent me. Every messenger came to give the message of Allah. Yes or no? They did not come to create their own organization, their own following, their own crowd. They came to do what Allah sent them to do. Isa is saying, I've been sent to do what I'm supposed to do. Yes or no? And he's saying that I've been sent uh, and I, uh, the command I receive is from the Father, meaning Allah. Meaning he is being communicated to from Allah and he's been sent to fulfill the mission from Allah. And that's the same thing that the Quran says. Never said I to them anything except what you commanded me to say. Oh Allah, I only said to them what you told me to say to them. Yes or no? Is he looking so far as the same person or a different person? Please tell me. He's looking like the same person to me. I don't know if everyone just let me know. Let's go on. He says he was a servant. What do we call ourselves everyone? Abd. Abd. What are we? Okay. We are slaves. An abin is the abd first. A worshipper has to first be a slave. If you want to be a pure worshipper of Allah, a abid of Allah, you have to be an Abdullah first. And Abdullah is a slave. He's a servant. I tell you the truth. No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. He made sure he was a servant in the Bible. And the Quran says he was a servant also. Yes or no? I am indeed a... What was the first word of Jesus, peace be upon him? When Maryam brought him and the people said, Oh Maryam, what did you do? What is this? Your mother was not unchanged. Your father wasn't a bad person. But Allah told her, be quiet. And point to the baby. كَيْفَ نُكَلِّمُ مَنْ كَانَ فِي الْمَهْدِ You're telling us to talk to a baby. We don't have that Google technology or AI technology. We're still working on it. How could a baby talk? And he said, إِنِّي عَبَدُ اللَّهِ I'm Allah's servant. I'm Allah's servant. I've been given a book. I've been made a messenger. He was a mortal, i.e. a human. He was a human. Who was Isa Islam? A human. When we recite Ayatul Kursi, what do we read? Could everyone read the beginning with me? Allahu. لا إله إلا هو الحي القيوم لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't even get tired or get sleeping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not eat or drink Yes or no? Allah is not in need of creation to keep him sustained Yes or no? Jesus talks about eating Jesus talks about drinking in the Bible If Jesus was God He would not need to eat or drink Yes or no? He wouldn't need to. So, Allah tells us even in our Quran in chapter 5, and what is the name of the surah? Surah Ma'idah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the surah which is named Ma'idah, the tablecloth. When the people of Isa said, ask Allah to send food from heaven. And Allah sends food from heaven. And they all eat from that food. So the fact that you eat or drink is a sign that you are what everyone? You are mortal. You're human. Allah does not sleep. Yes or no? And Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him up. Are we still talking about the same person or a different person? You tell me. 
See, I can argue till the cows come home with a Christian and say, this is what the Quran says about Jesus. Do you understand that? That's what we've always been doing. But when we can, for our knowledge, we're not learn, learning this knowledge so we can argue with people or to put people down. I am vehemently against comparative religions and putting religions down. I don't like that style. But for our knowledge to learn, the Bible is saying that which the Quran collaborates with it. Despite the fact Despite the fact that the English version of the Bible doesn't have the 14 books that was there when they translated it from Latin, and that Latin wasn't the official translation of what was the official translation in Greek, and that that Greek, which is the official translation, isn't the Aramaic and Hebrew, that was the word of Allah. Despite all these flaws, we still can find the Isa of the Qur'an to be the Isa in the Bible, subhanAllah. It's all there. Next. As a human being, we will all, as men, are circumcised. Right? Men are circumcised, boys, children are circumcised. The Qur'an, the Hadith talks about the judgment will be resurrected and even the flesh that was circumcised will be returned. It talks about Jesus being circumcised. If he was God or if he was someone else, this would not be the case. And it talks about Jesus being baptized. It also talks about Jesus being tempted by the shaitan. These are all things that happen to who? Allah or to, to humans? The creation of Allah. Who does this happen to? The creation or the creator? The creation. Okay, so we're on the same, the same spot. His belief. An expression of his belief. So we know thus far, Jesus of the Bible is looking just like the Jesus of the Quran and vice versa. And that both of them show that he is a creation and immortal, not God and divine. What can seal the deal? The fact that he shows and articulates that he believed in something. So, in the Qur'an, who is exalted in power and wise? Who is exalted in power and wise, everyone? I hear you all. Who is exalted in power and wise? Allah. And who did Jesus say is greater than himself? Allah. See, the metaphor of Father, son, let me explain it to you. It's a metaphorical phrase used for respect. Like in our cultures we call people uncles and auntie. That doesn't mean they're exact uncles and auntie. It is a respect, a token of respect you give to your elders. Because our deen said if we don't respect our elders and have mercy on our youngsters, we're not, we're not from the ummah of Rasulullah Sallallahu So the fact that this is an expression of respect, the translation from the Aramaic of the father, is to show the respect of a heavenly power. It is not the literal meaning that he is the father. There is a hadith, Al-Khalqu Ayalullah. The creation is Allah's family. Is that literal or metaphorical? Metaphorical. We're not going to do a, what is that, um, you do those DNA testings and stuff. Right? We're not going to do those DNA testings to find out we're children of Allah and Audhu Billah. We are Allah's creation. Yes? But it is a metaphor of the closeness and the bond. So, he believed in a higher power. He also made it clear that you cannot see the higher power. No one has ever seen God but God the one and only. In John chapter 1 verse 18, Jesus makes clear, no one can see Allah but Allah himself. Can human beings see Allah on this earth? Can shaitan deceive you and say he is Allah? Yes. Can shaitan deceive you and say he is Muhammad and Mustafa sallam? No. There is a reason why Rasulullah said, Man ra'ani fil manami faqad ra'ani haqqa. If you see me in a dream, you see me. Because shaitan cannot imitate me. He may come to you in a dream with his big life or this big wavy beard and say, I am Allah and I'm telling you, you don't have to worship anymore. And you can go do what you want in your life. That's shaitan. The same shaitan that approached Ibrahim when he was going to slaughter Ismail as an old man. He said, where are you going? 
And he said to him again when he met him again, he said, why are you going? And then he said to him a third time when he met him a third time, Allah doesn't need your son. He said, you are the devil. And he picked up stones and he pelted him. Who picked up stones? Ibrahim alayhi salam. What do we do with Hajj? We pick up stones and we stone. The same locations, well now it's not the same location anymore, but it's in the same proximity where Ibrahim alayhi salam pelted the shaitan. So, there is a higher power that everyone is working to seeing. Why are we striving for Jannah? Could anyone here tell me why do you want to go to Jannah? Because? Uh, you don't want to burn hell fire, that's why you want to go to Jannah, that's, that's fine, but I think it's a, that's not a good bargain, right? There's something in Jannah we're getting, right? What is it? Someone said it. Yeah? To see Allah, right? I love your comments. Keep it up, bro. To see Allah. When the people of Jannah will be in Jannah, Allah will call them. And Allah will tell the angel to remove the veil so the people can see their Allah. No one will see Allah until they're in paradise. No one will see Allah on the day of judgment. Judgment will occur, Allah will be there, but you will not see Him. Because only those who work towards purity will see Allah in Jannah. So you're going to paradise, why? Not for the flying unicorns or the, uh, the cars or the houses. You're going there for to see my Allah. I want to see my Allah. Do you want to see Allah? Sisters, do you want to see Allah? That is why we're working towards Jannah. And Jesus, peace be upon him, says, no one can see Allah but Allah Himself. And the Quran says, لا تدرك الأبصار وهو يدرك الأبصار. No vision can grasp Him. Musa Aleyhisam said, after talking to Allah for so long, Musa Aleyhisam said, Rabbi arini anzur ilayk. Allah, I want to see you. We've been talking for so long, I want to see you. Allah says, لن تراني. That means never. You can never see me. وَلَكِنْ انظُرْ إِلَى الْجَبَلْ Go look at that mountain. فَإِنِ اسْتَقَرَّ مَكَانَهُ فَسَوْفَ تَرَانِي If that mountain remains, you can then see me. Allah exposed a part of His beautiful self to that mountain and it became dust. It became dust. وَخَرَّ مُوسَى سَعِقَ Musa fell down unconscious. Our eyes are not strong enough in this world to see Allah. And now is the, not only is the Quran saying it, the Bible is saying it also. And who's saying it? Isa alayhi salam. Isa alayhi salam's belief is that he used to go in seclusion and pray. He would fall on his face like you do in sajda. And what did he do everyone? He prayed. What did he do everyone? He prayed. We're almost done here. And in the Quran says, Isa did not disdain to serve and worship Allah. Nor did the angels or those nearest to Allah. Why did Allah have to talk about Isa Islam having a resentment from praying to Allah? Why did Allah say that about Musa Islam? Why did Allah say that about all the prophets? That the prophets never had reservation to worship Allah. Because one of the things a God wouldn't do to God would be worshipping him. But Isa Islam is not God. So Allah in his divine wisdom said this in the Quran that Isa Islam does not disdain to serve and worship Allah. Meaning Isa Islam had no reservation. He worshipped Allah because he's a servant of Allah. And if you know that, and the Bible says that, you know that Isa is from the same person. It is imperative. It is mandated that you and I know who Isa Islam is beyond those features. Because if we see him, we better know him. And not the evangelical version or the orthodox version or the Lutheran version, but the correct version. Next, there is nothing like him, i.e. Allah. Is there anything like Allah? قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ اللَّهُ لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا This is a beautiful surah. This surah, the tafsir could be books. Books and volumes. Allah, there is nothing like Allah. This is the belief in Aqidah reinforced in the Quran and in the Bible. You have never heard his voice nor seen his form. I am God and there is none like me. Inna ni an Allah, as Allah said in the Quran, is also in the Bible. 
There is nothing whatever like unto Allah. There is nothing that can give you a similitude of who Allah is. If you understand that brothers and sisters, then understand that old faced man in the clouds is not Allah. Do not give a picture to Allah. Do not make this nature mother's nature. Because mother nature doesn't have a father or a husband. There's only Allah. Say Allah is one. Allah is Samad. He is not begotten nor was he begotten. He does not beget nor is he begotten. He doesn't give birth and nor was he given birth to. And there's nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So brothers and sisters, is the belief of Jesus peace be upon him in the Bible aligning with the belief in the Quran? Yes or no? Okay, mashallah, we're getting somewhere. And guess what? You cannot do anything without Allah. By myself, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, said Jesus in John chapter 5, verse 30. And also in the Quran, we learn that everything belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And a person cannot do anything without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now, what is the connection? We end with this. And hopefully, you have 10, 5, 10 minutes for questions, inshallah. There is a connection between all prophets, yes or no? Rasulullah Sallam came down and led all the prophets in salah to show that not only is he Sayyidul Anbiya, the leader of all prophets, but also to show that he has a connection with all prophets. Musa Sallam foretold of the coming of Christ, yes or no? And Isa Sallam also foretold the coming of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But you will say it's not in the Bible. If it was in the Bible, all Christians would believe. So let's talk about that right now quickly. Isa some foretold that if you love me, keep my commandments, i.e. if you love me and you follow the deen, I will pray to Allah, He shall give you another, another comforter that He may abide with you forever. If you practice the religion, I'll ask Allah to send you a prophet who will be with you forever. The nation of Muhammad Hassan will remain till the day of Judgment. Muhammad Sassam is a prophet to the day of judgment. Muhammad Sassam is not Isa Islam. He's the other comforter that Allah sent. And Isa Islam said, I will pray for that. But when the comforter is come, who I send unto your, you from your father, the next prophet will come, who I have given the seal of approval that will come from Allah, even the spirit of truth, which proceeded from the father, he shall testify of me. And he will also bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. What does this mean? That the prophet Muhammad Sallallahu will speak about the legitimacy and authenticity of Isa Alayhi Salaam, because this is all coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These verses tell us that Jesus, peace be upon him, foretold the coming of a prophet. Now what happened? Remember the system here, brothers and sisters? Aramaic and Hebrew, then Greek, and then from Greek, coin Greek to Latin, and then from Latin to Christian and all other languages, right? So, the person who Esai from prophesied, this was the word right there. Paraclete, or percolate in the Bible. The perversion of the actual word, parakalit. This word was deleted by interpreters and translators and changed at times to spirit of truth and other times as comforter and sometimes as Holy Spirit. So basically, in the Bible, in these same verses, the translation or tafsir is, Jesus foretold of His coming. Jesus foretold of his return that Jesus is the spirit of the truth or the Holy Spirit and he's going to come back and comfort the people. Are you all with me on this? This is the last part. Jesus, in those verses, according to Christians, foretold he will come back and do this. The original Greek translation of par- parkalit is the praise one. What is it? Praise one. I want you to remember that word. Because that is the name of, that is the name of Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu When Rasulullah Sallallahu was born, his grandfather took him to the Kaaba and said, "Samaytuhu Ahmad wa Muhammad." I've named him Ahmad and Muhammad. I've named him the most praised and the praised one. Yes or no? 
So if we take that word and its translation to be the praised one, then he was talking about who? None else but Muhammad Rasulullah But according to Greek classical lexicon, it means the intercessor. And what is intercessor in Arabic? The person who will do shafa'a. And the Quran speaks about Rasulullah doing shafa'a. He will intercede on the day of judgment. He will be the only prophet that will stand and say, Oh Allah, my ummah, my ummah. He will ask Allah for each one of us, inshallah, that Allah pardons us and forgives us. He is a shafi'a wa mushafa'a. He is an intercessor. So if you believe the word parkalid meant the praise one, it means Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And if you believe according to Greek lexicon, it means the intercessor. That also means Muhammad Rasulullah. So based on the Greek translation, you who will send the parkalite, the parkalite was the word being used. They did not translate the parkalite. But after, of course, we see the translations of it, and they say someone who is an advocate, a helper, guides to the truth. But it also has the word, the intercessor. And one of the translations proves the world wrong about Right, what is right and what is wrong, who glorifies Christ, Jesus wouldn't come back and glorify himself. So the paraclete is an intercessor. According to what exists in the Gospel of John, paraclete means the one who will intercede for a people. Rasulullah Sallallahu said, and we're doing, we're done with this, uh, this is the last subject matter. During my ascension, my mi'raj, I met Isa Islam on the second heaven. I found him of medium stature, reddish white. His body was so clean and clear, it was as if it appeared that he just took a bath. In another hadith, Rasulullah mentioned to the Jews that Isa is not dead. He will most surely return to you before on the Day of Judgment. Rasulullah is giving the legitimacy of Isa Why? To the Jews. Because the Jews didn't believe in Isa the Jews are yet to believe in Isa Islam. When Allah says the Jews are further than you than the Christians, is because the Jews haven't believed in Jesus. How will they believe in Muhammad Islam? They're talking about the faith. We're talking about the line. Allah says the Christians are closer. What does that mean? Christians believe in Musa Islam and Jesus. They just haven't believed in Rasulullah Islam. So when Allah is saying close, talking about distance of connection with the faith, the Jews are still two steps out because they still haven't believed in Jesus yet. But Rasulullah SAW gave legitimacy of Jesus and also of Musa AS. And that is why according to 1616 of John, that Jesus said, I will go, but then after that, you, will, you shall see me because I go to the Father. Jesus said, I'm going to go right now, I'm going to the Father, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And our Islam believes that Jesus is right now with who? Allah. And he's going to return from? Allah soon to live out his mortal life. How important is Jesus to us? Rasulullah Sallallahu said, and this is the final hadith. He said, whoever believes there's no God but Allah. Do we believe there's no God but Allah, yes or no? Do we believe he's alone without partner? That Muhammad Sallallahu is his messenger? And that Jesus is a servant and messenger of Allah? His word breathed into Mary and his spirit emanating from him. Yes. And paradise and hell are true. Yes. Shall be received by God into heaven. Why didn't Rasulullah Islam add Musa Islam? Why didn't he add Ishaq Islam? Why didn't he add Ibrahim Islam? Brothers and sisters, each one of our texts is linking back to something else. Is clarifying something, is setting a precedence for something. But when we see our text just as words, nothing will make sense. It will just be a hadith. It will just be a word. That is why we began tonight with this hope and goal that we start researching and we start diving deeper into the word so that each word of the Quran means something greater than just the word written itself. And this hadith itself emphasizes the importance of Isa Isa that if you want Allah to receive you in Jannah, you need to believe that Isa Isa is Abdullahi wa Rasulu al-Qaha ila Maryam wa Ruhum min. You need to believe this.
Beyond all the other beliefs that we have, this was emphasized and this hadith is recorded in Bukhari. So tonight we can say that Isa alayhi salam that we are referring to and that Jesus that Christians are referring to is one and the same person, yes or no? Number two, that the stories are different in the eyes of the people of that respective faith, but we believe that his story is very clear, who he is. So inshallah, next month, what do we do tonight? Tonight we set the case for what we're doing, and what we covered was, from the New Testament, we proved that Jesus isn't God. Do you understand that? If you go home tonight from last, what are we doing for two hours? We went through the New Testament, the Bible, and we learned that Jesus isn't God. Tomorrow, next month, inshallah, we are going to research from the Old Testament that God is in Jesus. Does that make sense? We want to cross-analyze it. If Allah, if Jesus isn't Allah, let's go to the text before and make sure Allah was in Jesus. Does that make sense? We are going to cover both of the historical documents just to make sure that our understanding is crystal clear. So who is Jesus in the Old Testament, inshallah, next month? Followed by his life. Followed by his death or ascension. Followed by the wrong crime for the wrong person. Followed by the crucifixion or the crucifixion. Why and how? And then inshallah, how will he return? Brothers and sisters, there's a lot to digest tonight. I don't want you to start worrying. I just want you to continue listening. And inshallah, go home and research. And inshallah, start understanding his whole life. You know why? Because if you understand the life of Jesus, السلام, you will have a whole understanding of him. Now you can start understanding the job. And when you have a complete understanding of the job, Gog and Magog will start making sense. Let me end by saying this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us this Qur'an so that in the midst of the deception of this world you'll be able to see right from wrong and guess what, this deception is already happening the deception is already happening it's not something that's going to happen, it's already happening and our Qur'an came to save us from deception in a world that is layered with deception, Qur'an and Hadith came to free us from that deception. So our goal is to make sure we become thinkers by assessing what the Qur'an, the Hadith, the Torah, the Injil say about Jesus, peace be upon him, the Jah, the Antichrist, and God and Magog. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for tawfiq. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to empower us with the knowledge of Islam from Himself so that we can be instrumental in upholding goodness on this earth and pushing away evil and wickedness. Ameen ya Rabbil Alameen. We have time for maybe one or two questions here. I apologize to sisters, we do not have a microphone. And ilahi. And ilah is la ilaha illallah. God is only Allah, right? So, as I said, there was a purpose effort being made throughout the centuries. Let me tell you what happened. The Jews till today, with all respect to all faith, the text of the Torah is controlled by the rabbis and shared to their congregations. You can't walk into Barnes and Noble and buy a Torah. You can walk into any airport, any hotel room, and you'll find a Bible. Because the Bible was manipulated perfectly. So you can pick it up and read it. And unfortunately, we're not here putting down our Christian brothers and sisters, because we, within the Muslim community, there are Muslims who have been manipulated through the Quran Hadith also, unfortunately. Because you can take a part and just run with it and say, this is your Islam. Where Islam is a whole word. It's everything. It's every aspect of it. So the problem here is that even till this day when you would go to church, you don't read cover to cover Bible like we read Qur'an in Ramadan or do the feed of Qur'an. It is section by section based on a story. So a picture can still be painted whatever you want to paint. It's like choose your own adventure book. Go wherever you want. Wherever I take you. And in the Torah, it is so restricted that it is between certain hands, not all hands. The Qur'an came to not tell us to investigate all this or to go into all this. It came to clarify. 
And Allah says that we sent this down to clarify مَخْتَلَفُ فِي In which they used to differ So yes, it was a mistranslation Because remember, English came in the 1600s 1600 years after the departure of Jesus peace be upon him So that's why I say one thing and now it's time We said 11 o'clock We'll end with this brothers and sisters And um, there'll be no follow-ups to this point But just keep this in your head Allah has promised to protect the Qur'an But He had not promised to protect the translation of the Qur'an And the manipulation of our Islamic text is already happening through translation It's already happening And that is why there is such a desperate need For the scholars to solidify in us What the message is And empower us so that we can uphold what the Qur'an is telling us Not what the Qur'an can be manipulated to become There is a brother I met in, in, uh, in America many many years ago in the 90's And he, um, he and I sat down and ate together And he was eating with his left hand I was eating with my right hand And he looked at me strange and I looked at him strange and I said to him, brother, why are you eating with your left hand? He said, why are you eating with your right hand? I said, because it's the sunnah of the Prophet He said, no, you're going against the sunnah of the Prophet Hadith is to eat with your left hand I said, forgive me, I'm studying Islam But I remember it's to eat with your right hand He said, I'll prove it to you in Hadith He brought a book It was a translation of Riyadh Salihin فَإِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ يَأْكُلُ بِشِمَالِهِ وَيَشْرَبُ بِشِمَالِهِ The hadith says, eat with your right hand because the devil eats and drinks with his left hand. That's what the Arabic said. But you know what the English said? Eat and drink with your left hand because shaitan eats and drinks with his right hand. Translations of the Qur'an only came about in the last 150 to 200 years. Not before that. And that's why I took you back to 1856 Something went wrong Really wrong So the colonization process That beyond taking over lands and changing cultural concepts and mindsets Religion was changed for good Quran wasn't changed Hadith wasn't changed The mindset of Deen in Islam has changed May Allah protect all of us I mean, we have an individual responsibility and that's why we're doing this and I hope to see you back, inshallah, with your brothers and sisters. I apologize, we have, um, and I'll say it clearly, we have a bad marketing here in this masjid. We market things the day before, and I've always said that. This program was marketed last night. But nevertheless, every third Friday of the month, this will continue for an hour and a half to two hours. I hope you come and sit down, and you allow this knowledge to absorb in you, so you become critical thinkers. اللهم ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا يا مولانا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم وافعل بنا ما أنت أهله فإنك أهل التقوى وأهل المغفرة سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين إن شاء الله tomorrow morning is our breakfast Fajr breakfast so إن شاء الله please come and have a breakfast with us after Fajr sisters and brothers and also إن شاء الله we have uh, the doctor's program tomorrow and the holistic lifestyle coaching program will take place here in the main prayer hall إن شاء الله